Welcome to the 2023 edition of the State of the Union, organized by the European University Institute here in Florence. Thank you for everybody who's in the room and the people who are connected online. My name is Alessandro Merli. I'm an associate fellow at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm delighted to introduce the panel on technological capabilities for the twin transition, linking European regions for cohesion. Joining us for today's discussion are Pierre Alexandre Ballin, of, uh, Utrecht, a professor at Utrecht University, Katharina Gnat, uh, who's senior project manager on the topic of Europe's future at Bertelsmann Stiftung, and Anna Sobchak, who's uh, policy coordinator at DGNR at the uh, European Commission, but also a EU fellow here at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Study here at the EUI. Uh, our discussion will be based on a study done by the uh, uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung uh, of the Foundation, Bertelsmann Foundation, uh, exactly on this topic, the technological capability for the twin transition for people who lived on the moon for the past uh, few years. Uh, twin transitions are the green and the digital uh, transition and joining us uh, uh, for today's discussion uh, is Pierre Alexander, who's one of the author of the, uh, uh, of the study, and I don't want to give a spoiler to what he will tell us, but uh, uh, we know the study shows uh, that uh, European regions have a very different uh, uh, performance in terms of their capabilities to develop green and te digital technologies, and this is a potential threat to uh, regional cohesion in Europe as it may contribute to uh, widening income disparity uh, here. What we know from the study is that uh, more developed EU regions are better equipped for developing technologies that digitize and green the economy and more than 80% of these uh, technologies are being developed uh, in the economically leading uh, regions. Uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Pierre Alexandre, who also has some, uh, don't get scared, but he has some, uh, uh, some slides, uh, PowerPoint, hopefully that will work. And uh, I will urge you uh, all that want to uh, tweet about this panel to use the hashtag SOU2023. Uh, Pierre Alexandre, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro, and uh, for also a fantastic uh, summary of the, of the study. Indeed, the study is out for like about, about a week, uh, so if you're interested in, uh, in reading it, I think we have about uh, maybe 50, 60 pages of, uh, of insights. And I would say uh, it's probably one of the most granular uh, study in terms of uh, mapping the capabilities of European regions in terms of twin transition technologies. So we can have, you know, carbon capture, AI, blockchain, essentially a lot of the key, transi uh, of the key technologies uh, that connects to either the green or the digital uh, transition. And essentially, uh, one of the first findings, and I think something really important, is indeed a very strong heterogeneity in the technological capabilities of region. That's something that you, you mentioned, but this is something uh, really, really striking. Uh, so essentially, if you're looking for uh, the regions that have the potential to lead the green or digital transition uh, in Europe, it really depends on the technology you're talking about. So there is a very strong diversity in terms of knowledge bases and the potential leaders, uh, we're talking about in the previous session about uh, the new era in terms of digital and green technologies, and the, the potential regions that have uh, what it takes to lead this transition depends very much on what we're talking about. So if you think about AI, for instance, we have very strong capabilities in Ile-de-France, in London, in Munich, but if we talk about carbon capture, you have to look towards North Holland, uh, part of Denmark, so it really depends on the technology that we have. And if we want to fully accelerate the green and digital transition, we have to bet on the right technologies in the right places. Now, another thing that you see if you look at this map over there, and in blue, you essentially have regions that have more of a digital profile. In green, uh, regions with a more green profile is that you don't see countries. 
So essentially, uh, technological transition and twin transition in particular is very much a regional uh, question, uh, much more than something at national level. Like we, we don't really find strong national boundaries, but what we find is a uh, very strong heterogeneity at the regional level. So no one size fits all uh, from both regional and technological standpoint. Now, one thing that you mentioned as well is uh, there is a risk, yeah? and uh, it looks like with a lot of this transition comes a uh, different type of risk, geopolitical, health, uh, global, you know, uh, global health, public health. But here, uh, the big risk in a twin transition uh, is, is actually on the, in terms of inequality. And uh, we know that the region that will lead you know, the development of Gen AI, for instance, they will have a very strong position and a very strong leading position, and they will take you know, a big part of the share of the, the economic returns in the future. What you see here, the cohesion policy of the EU has different categories and, and classify regions into like more developed, transition, and less developed. And here, what we have uh, in this graph, and you can see actually you get a little bit of an idea of the technologies that we, uh, that we map uh, in this report. So if you read the report, you'll see basically the distribution of technologies in big data, IoT, virtual reality, smart farming, biofuels. We have maybe, I think, about 40 uh, different technologies. And what you see here is the opportunity space for the more developed regions. And what you see is that the more developed regions, they have opportunities in technologies that have very high potential economic returns. So they are in the best position to lead the transition in technologies like IoT, 5G, big data, uh, AI. And if you look at uh, the less developed regions, what you see is that you, know, you don't have the same slope. So the previous slope is basically a lot of capabilities in the technologies that can lead the highest returns. When you look at the less uh, developed region, you see a different slope, and you see that, unfortunately, this upper right quadrant is a little bit missing. But you still have an, uh, a frontier where there is potential, and the potential here shifts towards biocides, biofertilizer. There is also an opportunity in some digital technologies like AI, mostly like software-based uh, digital technologies, much less when it comes to hardware-based uh, digital technologies. So if you look at 5G, photonics, um, broadband, you have much less of capabilities in the less developed regions. But the point of the story here is that we absolutely need to actively support the tech prioritization of less developed regions, because less developed regions have a harder time than more developed regions to actually select the right priorities for the ecosystem. They tend to select much more priorities, and these priorities are basically all over the place uh, in general. So we really need, in terms of policy efforts, to support this prioritization by understanding where essentially to invest, uh, simply as that. Now, another uh, angle of our study is we look at interregional collaboration. So we look at, in the production of these technologies, essentially, where, uh, like how the connections between regions are, are made. And what we find is it's not a good story for the EU. It's a very fragmented uh, research innovation area. So what you see is a very, very, very strong bias for being in the same country. So being in the same country is the most important factor and predictor of collaboration, much more than economic aspects. So you will expect Paris and Munich to collaborate a lot based on size, based on innovation impact, based on collective uh, complementarity, but that's not what you find. You find an extremely strong uh, national bias, and Paris, Ile-de-France will collaborate first with a tiny region that you've never heard of before collaborating with Munich or other, uh, other area. And this is detrimental to both cohesion and the global performance we've been talking about the entire meeting. Yeah? This, uh, the entire day we talked about the EU somehow lagging behind in the production of the key complex technologies. And you see that one of the main factors is that you still have an AI policy at the French level, at the German level. So countries compete together much more than connect, and that does not enable us to scale the technologies of this new uh, era. And that's even worse, actually, in the context of green uh, technology. So a key question here that has policy implication is, 
which connection to target in priority, and how to balance out a little bit this innovation system that's very biased compared to the US or China, and how do we make sure that you know, we really exploit the full potential of regions to connect and scale complex technologies. And here you have an example for a German region of this mismatch between the actual links on the left and the complementarity potential. So essentially, the region with whom this, uh, this region will connect in an ideal world in the context of hydrogen, uh, for instance. And you see there is a big mismatch. So we leave a lot of meat on the bone here. And how can we design policies to actually you know, promote this integration that is very detrimental for our overall uh, performance? And I won't go into detail uh, for lack of time, but essentially that's what you'll find in the report uh, for digital, for green technologies at the sub tech level as well, and we, you know, we tend to find this, uh, this issue here. And I will just leave the summary slide here, but essentially uh, what we find is that, yeah, there is no one-size-fits-all policy. We really require this kind of mapping, both from a regional and technological standpoint. We need more actively to support the tech prioritization of less developed region, and we need to target untapped potential in terms of linkages between EU region to improve global EU leadership and cohesion. Thank you, Pierre Alexander. I forgot to mention that the study also gives a very, very detailed and, and granular uh, look at the individual technologies and the individual regions. And uh, I think there's a wealth of information there that, that can really be exploited by researchers and, I would say, by policymakers, probably even more important. Uh, I would ask Katharina, uh, how is this, uh, the conclusion of this study, going to affect uh, or the situation as it is portrayed by the study going to affect cohesion in the EU? Because, of course, uh, what we want uh, is a European Union which is more of a union and less of a disunion. And it seems that these forces that are going to affect the future very much of the EU uh, are potentially uh, disruptive. Uh, so what does that mean for the strong regions and what does that mean for the weak regions? Thank you, Alessandro. I think there is a, the study has a story for all regions. So we looked at uh, roughly 20, uh, 250 regions across Europe and you'll, as you said, you'll find a plethora of information and it's sort of difficult to do justice to all these different individual stories. I think there is a, if you look at for an easy story, there is an easy there's a bad story and there's a good story. And the good story is probably the, the harder one, particularly for policymakers. The bad story for cohesion is, and Pierre-Alex mentioned it, uh, is that strong regions, and that's unsurprising if you want, strong regions have very strong technological profiles already in digital and green technologies, and that it makes it easier for them to develop new technologies. So there, there's a sort of chance that uh, you do good and then you do well in the future too. And that's bad for cohesion because uh, we are really worried about further divergence and, uh, and that's, that's something that we definitely don't want. The good story is, and that's the, I would call it the spaghetti bowl slide of Pierre-Alex, uh, the one that you just saw with these lots of different linkages and these different um, lines in yellow. And that's a story of untapped potential. And that actually holds for all regions. So whether you're a developed region in the center, in the periphery, whether you're a rural region, uh, uh, an urban region, that you have untapped potential that is uh, connected to what you already have. Um, and so all regions should be able to sort of develop further technologies based on what they have now in terms of digital and green technologies. Um, there is, a, sort of from a policymaker's point of view, there is the possibility with this kind of study to sort of look at what priorities regions should set. Again, that holds for developed uh, regions, but it's probably more important for the developing or less developed regions. So what technologies does it make sense to either invest privately, but also invest publicly into? Um, and then there's a second sort of good story, and that's the untapped potential that you get from sort of looking outside of your regional borders. So one worry is that in this sort of story of transformation, we have a lot of regions that are locked in and basically are sort of falling behind and, and, and are sort of yeah, falling by the wayside, if you want. But what the study shows is that 
if you look across your region and particularly across your national border, there's actually quite a lot of potential in order to team up with other regions and other technolog uh, technologies. So you don't necessarily, as a lagging behind region, need to go it all alone. You can also try and find other regions in your area, but also across borders, particularly across borders, uh, which have complementary technologies and basically team up and then develop further technologies. And I think that's sort of the good story, but that's also the story that needs work. Right. So what should be done uh, and what can be done, which is not always the same thing, at the European level, I'm asking uh, Anna, we know that uh, a large part of the recovery and resilience funds are, for instance, allocated or earmarked uh, uh, to green purposes. I think it's 37%, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and so there's important money on the table, but what should be done and what can be done to avoid this? Because, of course, we want more cohesion, but we want to, to use a, a phrase, level up, not level down, right? Uh, and one thing that came out of Pierre Alex's discussion also was that, in a way, the regions were bypassed. I mean, all these developments happen at the regional level, but it, the regions are not exactly the target for these funds that are included in this, in this plan. Thank you very much, Alexandra. First of all, let me congratulate you on the study. It's really good and, and fascinating. And for me, as a policymaker, I see lots of untapped potential for us, for policymakers to use. And it's not only for the regional policy, but it's also for innovation policy, for industrial policy, for climate and for energy, employment, you name it. So I think there is quite a lot of uh, to build upon. And as we saw in also the, the study and the, the map that you showed in Europe, and let me here quote our European motto, we are united in diversity, as you could see in this spaghetti map. Another thing that comes to my mind when we talk about this untapped uh, potential is here I see where we can really tap into the the innovation potential, it's when we use so-called Medici effect. And we are here in Florence. We're in Tuscany, in the Medici land. What does it mean, Medici effect? That you indeed bring innovation from one region to another, but also from one sector to another. And there you have this, the most disruptive Effect, And I think this is what it's really something to, to build upon and why in this particular context is important. And let me now zoom. We're talking about granularity. And I know that your study was done on the NATS 2 level. Uh, as somebody who is working on just transition, you probably know that I'm very much interested in this NATS 3 level. So we're going to really the community level to the cities um, and its surroundings. And this is where the things really happen, in this microcosm. And here we are really zooming in in concrete to look at the concrete actors who are on those territories which are also affected. You mentioned inequality. And there you ask yourself a question, what drives people to cooperate or not? What drives people to innovate or not? And then really, once you ask yourself these questions, you also see what are the incentives. And this applies equally to more developed regions, but also lagging behind. So we really have to, once again, I would voice this really looking more at the local level, and I would be very much looking forward to your follow-up study uh, <laughs> at the more of the, of the community level. I also see the synergies with territorial and just transition plans, uh, which indeed are looking at this cooperation, looking at the innovation, where we create jobs, and growth, also we're looking at the skills, because you mentioned green transition, uh, digital, so both twin transitions. This is where the 
most new skills are emerging, most jobs. Probably some of you are aware that recently World Economic Forum just published a report on skills. And the biggest job creating potential is in green transition. So, you know, there is lots of scope to scale up the findings uh, of your study. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This last observation ties up very much with what we were saying in the previous panel, <laughs> which I was also uh, part, where there is a lot of potential in the labor market exactly for these green jobs. And uh, that's something that people do not appreciate. Uh, often when we think uh, of new technology of all sorts, we think of uh, job-destroying technology. There's actually a lot of potential for job-creating technology, especially in the, in the green field. Uh, now, you provided with the Pierre Alexander with a, with a very good picture, very detailed picture of what the situation is, uh, which I think not in that, at that level of detail, but was probably in general terms uh, uh, known to uh, uh, researchers and policy makers in, in very general terms, not in the detail way that you presented, but so what are the obstacles to remove the, uh, to, to obtain this uh, increased regional collaboration? Of course, uh, we go back in some sense the fact that a lot of the collaborations at the national level, the yeah. usual talk about language, legal systems, uh, you know, that tend to have people uh, within Europe to look within their own country, but what are the other obstacles that prevent this regional collaboration, this, as you say, more fruitful cross-border collaboration? So th that is a, a great question, of course, and kind of uh, almost the, the edge of our, of our report, huh? and something we don't dig into uh, too much, but uh, we, we, we have some, some elements of answer because that's also where the lever is, and if you want to improve this, you also have to understand a little bit what are, what are the key obstacles. And uh, I would say that uh, there are things we cannot change, right? We talked about cultural difference, we talked about languages. Okay, these things we, we cannot change. But this doesn't seem to be an, an obstacle in other settings. If you look at the, you know, 60% of the CEOs of the Silicon Valley in the tech industry are foreign born. So <laughs> if you want to understand the, the reason why the US is so innovative, it's because it basically attracts a lot of talent from all over the world that basically integrates and, and, and can uh, you know, essentially go, go beyond uh, some kind of language barriers as well. So all of these to me are very, and for someone who's been uh, working in, in many countries, uh, also in Europe, it's never seemed to be like really the, the, the issue. In that context, uh, if I would say like one of the obvious challenge and issue is actually going back to one statistic that was mentioned earlier, like the 40% uh, investment of the federal budget in, uh, you know, in the US, well, 1% here in, in Europe, and it's because it's very much at the member state level. So a lot of the policies, a lot of the action, a lot of the research programs, a lot of the grants, they, they have a national boundary by itself. And that to me, and unless we, we break that, uh, we, we're not gonna make uh, much, uh, much progress. So again, if you think about, uh, l just look at the AI policy that have been like every country in the world has its own AI initiative. Still, we have a Croatian AI, we have a German AI, we have a French AI, we have a Spanish AI, and you, you, you still see a very, very strong national bias in that respect, which does not make much sense for technologies like, like, like this. And also to understand very well in this context of, of digital technologies, if we don't scale, if we don't collaborate, if we don't integrate, we're gone. The very first Facebook was not in the US, it was in Hungary. But then of, uh, maybe you, you, you remember that. Uh, so it was in Hungary, and Hungary is a fantastic, uh, actually, a hotspot of digital technologies. But then as soon as Facebook entered you know, the market in Hungary, you know, it basically went to zero, number of users, because people had an alternative, but then cross-country. So scale is everything in these technologies. Um, so we have to understand the urgency. We have to understand that we're never going to have a competitor to Google or to OpenAI or to Microsoft that will be a German one or a French one. Either we're going to have a European one or nothing, which is the case now in the digital world. So I would say one of the obstacles is to understand to what extent this is true. So I think if this is a message we believe in, we need to diffuse it because it's like either we work together or we don't really have a, a seat at the global table. And I think this is not entirely 
believed yeah, overall in the, in, in, in the European context. So I think it's, it's about understanding the reality of the situation and that we have to work together, first of all. The second one, as I mentioned, is like, is like policy. And the third one is to really move, I would say right now, a lot of the research innovation is done at the national level. We have to move down and up at the same time. Down at the regional level, so we have to give much more power and capabilities to the regions, because regions themselves are much more likely to collaborate. And we see with border regions, for instance, uh, collaborating very much across border, because if it's better on the other side, we just do it. So regions actually are pretty willing to do that. So we have to move, but not nations, <laughs> not countries. So we have to move down and then up at the EU level in a way where we need to integrate, to avoid duplication of research efforts and to really have you know, this kind of coordinated uh, level. In a way, the states want to keep their prerogatives, but they're ready to blame the EU, blame the EU when something doesn't, doesn't work. You also touched about something at the regional level, which is the institutional and administrative capacity uh, to run uh, these technologies and this, or to promote or to incentivize these, these, uh, these projects, you know, and. Uh, there is a question of capacity building. I was recently at a presentation about the Italian PNRR, as it is called here, the, the National Plan for Resilience and Recovery, and the uh, presenter, a government official from Italy, was telling us the story about the projects uh, in, uh, uh, for kindergartens, which are considered important in Italy to promote uh, an increased uh, women uh, participation in the labor force by women. And the interesting thing, or the sad thing, was that a lot of the projects that were presented for financing from the, for the PNRR uh, were presented by some of the northern regions, uh, which are already rich in daycare for children, and none of them came from some of the southern regions who are actually very poor in uh, daycare for children. And so the people who will accrue more benefit will be people who already have that. So I wanted to ask you, Katarina, this question of, of capacity building. How do you tackle that? And also, I understand that Bertelsmann, I don't want to give anything away here, is uh, going on the next level from the study and try and think of matching some of the regions uh, to do more cooperative work on these two, on these twin technologies. I was, I was, uh, I was quickly surprised, and I thought maybe you know something that I don't. But no, you're you're totally right. Um, I think that's a big one, the institutional capacity. And if you, if you take this regional focus on the digital and the green transition, institutions come into play, and then it gets to be a mess if I put it bluntly, because at the moment we're looking at these regions, these are sort of administrative units, but how a region is mandated, how a region is funded, how a region is uh, elected, if you want, how, how regions decide is so different from uh, within countries, uh, but also across countries. Um, and so there it gets very, the picture gets very blurred. If you want to now look at sort of how you can sort of raise the level of institutional capacity, because that is sort of the hinge if you want to have the regions on board and the regions developing their strategies and potentially even looking outside of their region. One, I think one sort of option is to, um, for cohesion policy, is not to only look at um, the development stage. So usually in cohesion policy, you would say you have less developed regions and that's X percent of average GDP, very technical, and then you have transition regions and some of them have been trapped for long term and some of them are sort of move, catching up and then you have the more developed regions. What we're seeing now, and I think the study feeds to this, is that these regions, even if they are in the same, let's say, um, development stage in terms of income, they can have totally different potentials and prospects for developing new technologies, as Pierre Alex has shown. And I think one way of looking at this sort of capacity building is to match regions and to sort of think about regions uh, also in terms of their structure and their future potential. And then you can kind of see and sort of learn from others. So you can be let's say you are Sicily and you are sort of a hidden champion in some digital technologies, then you might sort of look at regions 
in the north or in the center of Europe, um, also from a policy, regional policymaker point of view, um, that can be a sort of inspiration for you. Um, I think this, this, this matching idea is, is, is sort of to see what you can learn from other regions that um, might have a similar economic structure, similar techno technological profile. Um, I think that's sort of one, one thing. And the second thing is, if we really want to make good on this Green Deal and the digital decade in Europe, and we have this sort of big headline tasks that we want to fulfill, I think the EU has to think much more carefully of how these uh, policies are implemented at the regional level. Uh, and it, I, I see why EU institutions are uneasy with this, because all of a sudden they don't have 27 interlocutors, but they have 249 or something. Um, but I think the, the transformation only happens through the regions, and uh, regional policymakers, regional politicians, the regional political system is a sort of linchpin, and you need to invest in this also from an EU perspective, even if it's, and I end again with a point, a lot of work. There's another thing that's mentioned in the report, and I don't, don't know if either of you wants to, uh, wants to answer that, uh, uh, and that is mentioned briefly in the report, and that's education. I think we need a change of pace in terms of education, uh, for both uh, technologies, I mean, both in terms of uh, digitalization and uh, uh, the green technology. And that's probably something that's, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, is largely missing in, in Europe at the moment. I don't know if, if Pierre Alex, you, you've given some thought to that, or Katarina? I can briefly mention, I think you have a lot of things to say because we don't touch too much on that in the report, but just one thing that I'm burning to say is that there is a big mismatch in terms of the skills that we produce, not just that are there, but that we produce and we keep producing. And I'm, I mean, I'm a professor, so I see that how slowly our educational systems are changing, the classes we teach, the programming languages we teach, how slowly they are changing compared to how quickly the tech world is changing it's and the demand too. for skills. It's <laughs> complete, I mean, it's in large extent our fault. Um, so this mismatch here is, is problematic, but it was a problem maybe 20, 30 years ago, but today the tech world is changing so quickly, the demand for skills is changing so quickly that uh, we, we don't have this kind of uh, buffer anymore. We have to make sure that we, we, we are aligned. And we are also aligned in terms of the technological capabilities in the regions and the potential, because there is nothing worse than, than, than training also like a, an, an immense mass of, uh, of, of young people that basically won't really have a chance to, to use this knowledge uh, either locally or at another level. Anna, you wanted to come in here. Yes, definitely, because I would like to remind all of you that this year is European Year of Skills. And I think it is very important to, to emphasize because there are so many different opportunities as well to tap into, to kind of um, ki narrow this gap between the skills needs and skills offers, so the education, but also training. And here, what is crucial is also having this dialogue between businesses, between industries, but also between the research, education, and regions, and regional authorities uh, and local authorities to know what can be done, as you may be also aware of our sector skills alliances in various sectors which they prepare the different roadmaps for skills, the vision, the strategy. So I think this is a very important challenge for us, which is recognized by European policymakers at EU level. And we are really trying to deal with it. There is also a pact for skills that many sectors sign up as well, what, uh, how they want to commit um, to Developed to match again those skills with, with the needs. And another aspect I would like to mention also in this particular context is when you think what's most important in Europe, the biggest achievement of Europe, and what when you talk to young people, you mention education, it's usually towards young people, is indeed Erasmus. And what is Erasmus? It's about learning new skills in a new settings 
in a different country, in a different region, in different circumstances as well, and also having this exchange, having language. this cooperation in different language, different cultural settings. And this were the single, I'm an Erasmus generation myself. I benefited from vast well, the experience and knowledge thanks to Erasmus, it shaped me who I am. And I think many of us can also, so I think it's, it's this kind of blueprint also for, for the future that we should also keep in mind that that's also the strength and the value added of, of Europe. Katharina. I wanted to, to sort of jump into this uh, question of skill level again and remind myself and everybody else that when we think about technology, we often think about something like a wizardry, a wizardry. So something very like shiny and super complicated. What this study shows and, and maps is different levels of complexity in these sort of future, if you want, future technologies, both digitally and also green. So if you, if you remember these, these, these bubble charts, so not the spaghetti chart, but the bubble chart, it's, it's sort of mapping how complex these technologies are. And some of them, particularly in the green field, um, in some of the less developed regions, they're less complex. So I think we shouldn't just sort of think about this this uh, very visionary, only this sort of big uh, visionary maybe company that is uh, sort of, uh, yeah, magic, but it's, it's, it's also bread and butter, incremental development of technology also sometimes at a lower level of complexity. And I think, so if you, if you see this, I actually see this as an opportunity, particularly for developing uh, regions, less developed regions, but for Europe as a whole. And I think if you look at education and upskilling or reskilling, you don't necessarily need to get everybody into the new European Google, but there is sort of a broad range of technologies that you need to have sort of the workforce and the educated workforce for. That, that, that's very true. Uh, and I wanted to broaden the horizon a little bit because, you know, in Europe sometimes we talk a lot about themselves, uh, if we're living in an island and with no relation to what's happening in the rest of the world, and especially with regard to these two technologies, we see uh, the US moving in one direction with lots of subsidies in several areas, semiconductors and other things, uh, and China, of course, proceeds in it, at its own pace, in its own way. Uh, the government there is able to impose things, uh, so uh, it, it makes things much easier sometimes. So I was wondering if you, looking at it, you could say, is Europe at risk of uh, being uh, squashed by these two superpowers or being left behind by them in this uh, digitalization and, and green technology, or you see hope? I certainly, being an optimist, and always looking at a glass half full, I'm definitely an optimist. And here, if I can see more about the green transition, because I think this is where the biggest potential. Digital transition, you already know, have been going on for, for quite some time. But I, I can tell you, and here I would like again to remind that European Union is the only bloc in the world that Green Deal is our uh, economic growth strategy. It has, you know, reaching climate neutrality enshrined in, the, in, our, um, in our strategy. So it's many countries around the world are looking what we at the EU are doing for reaching this uh, climate neutrality. They're looking, for instance, even when you mentioned national recovery plans, it was about the recovery from the COVID crisis. But as you rightly pointed out, it was earmarked 37% for investment in green transition and digital transition. And what's really impressive that many of the member states indeed bypass it. So not only reach this 37% they committed, but even bypassed it. So it's really this big drive. So I see we should really uh, be proud of uh, that we're going at the right direction. Thank you. Okay, I want to move on from two questions from the audience, but I think uh, Pierre Alexander yeah. wants to add something. Thank you. Very fast, but on this question, it's so important, I think. Uh, Europe is leading the green transition. Policy, as you said, but also technologically speaking. We did other studies. Europe is leading the, the green transition. It was even mentioned by the, the Global uh, Mackenzie Institute. You know, I 
in the top 10 technologies, Europe is lagging in eight, but one of the two is clean technology, but it's not a subset or a footnote eh, of technological progress. It's really important. And that, I think we, we can all agree on that, so that's really important. In terms of uh, digital skills, uh, we have the skills, we have the research. The problem is that our top inventors are going to the US. Okay, that's the, that's the big problem. And we also have policy levers to actually catch up that I won't enter here in, unless you're interested, uh, that we haven't explored. So we can also be hopeful in that respect. We're not starting from scratch. Maybe there will be a question on that. There is a roving mic. We have the first question here in the front row. Hi, uh, Thomas. I work for the Institute for Climate Economics, a think tank based in, uh, in, in Paris. Uh, two questions, one super quick. What's the name of the Hungarian Facebook? Um, <laughs> second uh, question. Um, I would like to challenge the idea that we are leading on the green transition. I think we are leading on the green transition, but not on clean tech production and clean tech manufacturing. Um, if we look at the latest study by the International Energy Agency that was uh, released in January, uh, they estimate that the global clean tech, well, I mean, the global market for six specific clean technologies by 2030 will be $650 billion. So that's the global share. What is the likely production? Where is it coming from of those 650? 400 from China, 100 from the US, 80 from Europe, and the rest from India, Japan, and other countries. So for using that metric, we're clearly not leading on the clean tech manufacturing. And obviously, like the commission has proposed the Nazar Industry Act, and that's very nice and fine and very useful, uh, but we don't have an investment plan. Uh, and so the question then for, for you is, what kind of investment plan, what are the key features of an EU long-term climate investment plan that could help scale the production, the development of the production of clean tech in Europe? Uh, and if you have views, especially on what we did wrong 20 years ago on digital, and a few lessons learned, I'll be eager to hear them too. That's four questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start really, really quick, and then I'm uh, happy Maybe to, the, to The next follow. questioners will limit to uh, themselves. You're talking about manufacturing, and you're right. I was not talking about manufacturing. I was talking from a technological standpoint. So if you look patents and other indicators, so definitely manufacturing is a different story. But you see, we're on par with the US in that respect, which is a very different picture. 180 is different from 400, 100, which is very different from also what the narrative is and what's happening in the digital world. VVV is the Facebook, but I'm happy to share you exactly the, 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 the link. Uh, in terms of, I will leave the policy question, and, uh, but what we did wrong with the, um, uh, the digital part as well, is basically, you know, we missed the internet revolution. And that was a big problem because then you don't have also like the exceed liquidity of startup, internet startups, you could not train your AI in the same way. And what China did right in that case was a police intervention which was just cutting the internet in half and protecting, a super protectionist measure in protecting you know, the entry to the market and have a, they also have a big market. So they could train generation of AI and then technology sectors, internet company, and that's why you have a Beidou, that's why you have a, a Tencent, that's why you have a Alibaba. But then, we know that then it's, it's a policy action. So in 2003, yeah, the, the, the digital sector in China was not that big. So there is policy action. And if you think about ChatGPT training its uh, algorithm based on European data as well, and then you know, like selling back to Europe, and then you know, we're losing jobs here, there is also a political action, a policy action, to also preserve our resource and treat data as a, as an, as a, you know, like a European resource, and then basically kind of put a little bit of a fence on it. So there, there, there are levers. I wonder, and it's, it's an open question, how China will manage with uh, Gen AI, you know? How are they going to limit the access and the topics and what you can ask the like of ChatGPT, you know? Uh, this is going to be very tricky for an authoritarian state, I guess. Uh, do we have any other questions? Or did you want to add something? Or if you have any other questions? Maybe on the clean tech, I will just add something. Because uh, EU does recognize its importance, and we provide quite significant also funding. And when you look, uh, when you look at Horizon Europe, as well funding, when you look general for this particular, now with the new uh, strategies coming. So I think it's, it's also a new potential, so funding as well, and again, uh, I would repeat this learning from each other, because I think this is also um, the big value added of Europe, that we can really share our, each other's experiences and build it upon other, each other's experiences. 
in this particular field and also across the world. Thank you. I'd like to add one thing, and I don't know who wants to answer that, but uh, uh, we've talked so far about you know, basically the pu public sector, right? Uh, the EU, the states, the regions, etc. But uh, are we good enough at involving the private sector, multinational? When you say, you know, the young people who know, then they're moving to the US, is that because there are the right incentives there in the private sector that we don't have here, or is there some other reason? Are we, are we doing enough to involve the private sector in all this talk uh, where, you know, there's a lot of activity at the public sector level, but of course, you know, things don't move without private sector involvement. I don't know who wants to take that. I could talk about small and medium enterprises, <laughs> <laughs> because I think they're the engine of growth. And also, they're the most, they're the most innovative, indeed. It's the bigger one that then later it's going up. And the small and medium enterprises, and also startups, need support to scale up. So then we also have the mid cups, and they can grow here in Europe, not leave Europe. So I think this is very important that we at uh, European level and also here is the role for national, regional, local authorities to support small and medium enterprises. All right. Any other questions from the maybe, audience? Or, maybe a yeah. PS to this, and I've been hesitant to, 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 to jump in. But obviously, we've focused I think both Anna and me have focused more on, on, on sort of the innovation, and Pierre Alex as well, innovation policy, sort of a little bit cohesion policy, which involves sort of public funding. Um, and not necessarily, we haven't really sort of dove into the question of funding of these technologies in general or financing. And I, I think there's, if you open up this sort of question of how much happens in the private sector and how do you sort of incentivize the private sector, there's also the question, how does the private sector finance this? And, and we get into another discussion, and I think that will probably sort of uh, make this panel explode about how you finance uh, this, this green, particularly the green transition. Um, when you then talk about things like capital markets union and fragmentation of, of the sort of financial flows across Europe. But I think the sort of main message that the study has and that is sort of repeated in the European story is that it only works if we scale up. And I think if you then talk about uh, things like financing, you also have to talk about hurdles again and sort of this sort of cross-border financing, uh, different, tap into different financial markets. This would be a whole different discussion. I just wanted to sort of raise it because the EU has some levers on this too. And I think as far as I understand, particularly Capital Markets Union is sort of almost a dead horse on arrival. It has been around, around for quite a long time, but it's not sort of a high priority. But if we don't want to keep on financing all these things publicly, and I think both at the national level, but also at the European level, there are limits. Um, to how much we can spend, um, we have to have the second discussion again. Well, the Capital Markets Union is a nice headline, but it seems to be always postponed, right? Mm. It's always this medium term that never comes, or long term that never never comes. And just to, to address like, uh, directly your point as well, I think it's a great point, completely agree with you. Um, I would say we have to think whenever, the EU is great at doing regulation, there are some you know, good and bad, but we need to integrate the innovation impacts when we build regulation. There's been a fantastic study, actually a set of studies on the impact of GDPR on the startup scene in the EU. You know what's the impact? Well, it, it, we basically we shot a bullet in our foot. Why? Because we make the compliance standards too high for startups. But then Google, Facebook has an army of lawyers, way too much money to pay the fine, to pay them whatever, to be compliant. So we actually create a barrier to enter in our own market for like the smaller companies. And I think we really have to integrate this in the equation when we think about uh, regulation. For instance, an easy way to do it, sandbox. You know, there's a limit where it only applies, some regulation only applies after a certain size, a market size. You know, so you make sure you don't kill 
you know, the, 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 the market too, too early. And that, I think, uh, we made progress. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty young in the game of policy and EU policy, but I've seen that changing, at least in terms of mentality. Uh, and, and that's something really, really important. And then we need to understand how to use regulation as a comparative advantage, not against our industry, but, you know, in favor of industry. Because there, there are ways. And let's remember that this ChatGPT data does not come out of nowhere. It comes from content creators like you and I when we you know, write on a blog. And that's a resource that we can also protect, but with a strategy in mind, with an industrial policy, with an innovation policy in mind, where the goal is to make EU, Europe more competitive, okay, not less. So that's something really important and not trivial. Very good. That's very interesting, and I'm afraid um, we're urged to uh, bring this to... Uh, an end, uh, and maybe we'll have this discussion next year, State of the Union uh, conference. And thank you all very much for joining us, and stay tuned for the next panel, which will start at, I think, 4.30, and it's about equality and its pivotal role in the European democracies in 2023 and uh, beyond. Thank you very much for being with us, and uh, thanks for the, to the panelists for their interventions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>